The truth is, somebody else may be able to do that job better. I thought I was gonna have to be good at everything. It's okay to pick a lane, and it's okay to have that lane be something that you're very, very passionate about. You need to know where your interests lie and where your strengths are, and we need to be okay with there are some weaknesses that don't need to become strengths. What is up? Welcome back to the Drum Show Podcast. I'm excited about... Um, this particular episode we're going to be talking about, and I know some of you are like, oh, come on, that title, it's Jump Secrets, the pros know, and they don't teach, right? Um, there are several things within drumming and within music that coming up were presented in a way that when I started uh, working as a musician, it wasn't really true. It wasn't kind of how that really was in the world of music. Um, and I've got, I've got several examples of that, but I wanted to talk about three today um, that I think can help you move your playing forward, whether that just be in the mental area, whether it be in your practice time. Um, I remember I, I first started to kind of understand this. So uh, back whenever Modern Drummer Magazine was Man, Modern Drum Magazine used to be the thing, right? It makes me sound really ancient. You got a magazine in the mail? Like, they, I waited every month. So I lived in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. And, um, and so any contact I could have with the outside world about music... I want it, right? I lived about 20, 25 minutes outside of town. Um, the town wasn't huge, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, I had a great drum teacher, a great drum teachers. Um, but again, it's like there wasn't the, you know, the internet wasn't a thing. I'm, I'm of the generation that had an analog childhood and a digital teenage years, right? High school. And, that, and we're kind of a unique thing, right? After the Generation X, it's like we had this weird experience where we understand what it was like growing up without these things, but then they were introduced in high school and college. I remember when first, when Facebook came around in college, and that, again, that makes you sound really old, but you're not. It's just moved really, really quickly. And so Modern Drummer used to be the thing, and I always grew up thinking, man, if I could just write for Modern Drummer, that would be awesome. So I moved to Nashville and started uh, taking road gigs, things like that. And my very first... <laughs> Uh, my very first tour, uh, it was 15 days long, two and a half, two and a half weeks-ish. Uh, it was a harmonica blues band, a cat I had met while I was in Mississippi. Uh, he was coming through Nashville, needed a drummer for this run, and I'm like, sure, let's do it. Uh, they're much older than me. The music was not what I grew up with, right, but I'm game to play it. Go out, and it's a van for those of you that have ever done any touring, it was a van tour. Not only that, we were not pulling a trailer. So some of you that conjures up, you know, when you don't pull a trailer on a, you know, touring situation for a couple of weeks, what happens is you take all of the seats out. And this was before, like, they had cooler vans that you could build bunks in and stuff. No, you just, like, took them out. So there was the two passenger seats, one bench seat, and the rest of the 15-passenger van was for gear. And we had, uh, they had something called the coffin. It was basically the base, uh, uh, the base amps turned on their sides and we slept on that. We put a sleeping bag on that. It was right behind there. It was big enough for me to do this and sleep. Anyway, so um, it was really an eye-opening experience for me. It didn't pay a ton. It was like, I don't know, 500 a week or something. It really wasn't a lot of money. Um, but I, you know, I was young, poor, just out of college and willing to take whatever. And, and two, you need to, you need to put your time in, like you need to do those things. I, I got in the middle of this and it was just going downhill so badly with as far as like the types of venues we were playing, where we were staying. And it's, it, I, I was thinking one night, I said, I'm going to quit and fly home. I'm just going to fly home. This is crazy. I don't want to do this. Um, and, but it was going to cost me more to ship my drums home <laughs> than I would have made on the whole run. So I stayed out. Anyway, uh, got back and wrote a couple of humorous op-ed pieces and submitted them to Modern Drummer. Waited a couple months, heard back from them. Uh, really kind message. They said, hey, these were actually really great. They were hilarious. Uh, we passed them around the office. Everybody thought they were really truthful and, and, and hilarious. They're a little dark for what we usually publish. And so for that reason, we can't really include them in the magazine. And that's whenever I stepped back and I was like, wait a second, a little dark. This was this is not even exaggerating what this is just the truthful events that happened on the road in a van tour with some guys I didn't know like this was a truthful working thing and I, I was like no no people need to know this because growing up touring was painted as a certain thing and now this is actually what it was like and you can um it's a great documentary I forget if it's on Amazon Prime or Netflix um it's all about um 
side men or side women. Um, and and uh, I, for, I forget what it's called. Um, not the other one. That's the one about the Grateful Dead. I forget what it's called anyway. Uh, but it's about hired guns. I think it's called Hired Guns, actually. Anyway, look it up. It's really good. Um, and it's all these cats that I was reading about on a Drummer and all that. And they're talking about, yeah, when I came off the road, I'd have to go paint houses because I wasn't making enough money to make ends meet. Like They were presented as like, you know, this is, you're making millions. And they're like, yeah, no, I was just making a few hundred a gig and just trying to, to make ends meet. So that was when I first was like, wait a second, there are some things here that's kind of like insider knowledge that I don't know. And I think there's some that apply to everyone, not not just if you want to be a professional musician or a drummer. I think they apply to everyone. If you just want to be a hobbyist, I think these apply. And I've learned them over time. And I've got them jotted down. I just didn't want to forget uh, the points I wanted to say. So the first one is you don't need to be great at it all. Weaknesses are okay and help you define your lane. The truth is somebody else may be able to do that job better. I didn't understand that when I was when I was taking lessons and everything. I mean, I thought I needed to be a master of everything. So one of my first teachers, fantastic player, um, Henrique, and um, he uh, was teaching at Berkeley College of Music here recently. He's got his own drum school now in Colorado. Beautiful soul, beautiful soul. The way things were presented, though, I thought I was going to have to be good at everything. So, I mean, I was learning cha-cha and mambo and jazz and the rudiments. Like, I was learning all of this stuff right out of the gate. And I grew up on punk rock, right? And some of the music I was honestly just not interested in. Now, this was a good thing because there are some players that are that are uh, more generalists. So, they, they are good at several things. They are... Uh, reasonably okay at others and can get by. So they, there's a, a wide swath of gigs that they can take. And that's kind of how my gigging life looked from when I started getting paid to play, which was age 15. I started gigging at age 14 at my church three times a week that led into paid gigs. And by 19, I was doing it full time. But there was a time where I was in eight or nine different groups all the way from early 20s, 30s swing to indie rock to frat rock uh, to big band, uh, Calypso. Like I was doing just about everything you could think of. And I was gigging in Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, that kind of tri-state area. I was the go-to drummer for a lot of orchestral stuff. I was doing a ton of off-Broadway stage shows. And I enjoyed the variety, right? I enjoyed the variety. I became known in that area as the guy. You, I was kind of the, the the multi-tool guy. I could do, yeah, you need some swing? I can do that. You need a mambo? Gotcha. You need some funk? I can do the indie rock? Let's go. You know, I kind of was a generalist, and that was my strength area. But the more I've I've gone in my career and the and the longer I've played, it's okay to pick a lane. And it's okay to have that lane be something that you're very, very passionate about uh, and that you know makes you want to get up every morning. Um, I talked to a student not too long ago and they were having some trouble being motivated to to practice. And he said, you know what? Really, I just want to play in my buddy's country band. And I said, Okay, well, are you doing it? No. Well, why aren't you doing that? Well, he's offered it. I'm like, you should do that. Well, I'm working on jazz. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your whole purpose for playing the drums is you wanted to jam with your buddy in his country band? Yeah. Why aren't you doing that? You know, yeah, 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 learn jazz. Sure, that, that's fine. We can learn. But you need to know where your interests lie and where your strengths are. And we need to be okay with understanding that... Um, there are some weaknesses that don't need to become strengths. And there are some weaknesses that need to be shored up. Now, let me make the distinction there, okay? This podcast is brought to you by the Drum Better Daily program. That's actually my online drum school that I've run now for 12 plus years. Not only have I been playing the drums professionally since the age of 15, I've been teaching since the age of 18. Uh, matter of fact, I talked to one of my, uh, or actually my first student a few days ago. Uh, I actually called him to, to see if he could sub a gig out for me. Daniel, love you, man. Uh, and he's still playing. He's still doing it on a pro level. I would love to have you go check it out at stevensdrumshed.com. You can find uh, a link to that in the show notes or video description, whichever uh, platform you're watching it on. But it truly is a community of like-minded drummers where we are striving to just be the best that we can be at the drums. In addition to over 70 pre-recorded drum courses, there's also a tech talk area where we talk about everything technology-related as it pertains to the drums, e-kits, recording, 
doing videos, all of that stuff. There are forums where you can hang out with the other students as well. We do two live video student calls every week that you can join if you'd like to. We do guest artist calls monthly, and I'll even make you a personalized lesson plan if that's what you need. Yes, we talk about the nuts and bolts of drumming. Yes, I give you exercises, but we also talk a lot about how to practice more efficiently, how to practice better, and how to get more out of your practice time. I know you're just like me. You're busy, you're being pulled by work, by family, by friends, by other responsibilities. Whenever you practice, you really wanna see gains and have it be productive. That is what we focus on in the Drum Better Daily program. I'll have to say personally, it's been really cool because some of these students I've worked with for over 12 years, we started running drum camps last year in 2022, and I got to meet some of them in person for the first time. Those drum camps have been selling out. They've been just blowing my mind with, with how much fun they are and how uh, great a time it is to bring the community together in person. A community that was started online and has been going online strong now for over 12 years. I'd love to have you be a part of it. When you have a weakness, we oftentimes think of that as a negative thing. I think of some weaknesses as a positive thing. Let's take this ounce out of the realm of music. Okay, uh, uh, I was never really great at like talking to girls. I guess like what guy running game with girls. Like I was just not good at that. I wanted to dive like into a deep conversation, which no one wanted to do at a party. You know, I was like, you know, what's your purpose in life? You know, <laughs> what makes your soul tick? And they're like, uh, you want another drink? I was just never really good at that. Well, it turns out in a marriage, that's a strength that you're not very good at, you know, talking to other women. You need to become very good at talking to one woman, right? If you If you're married, but it wasn't, this is a weakness that I'm okay with having at this point, right? If we go to a party, I'm the awkward guy if a girl comes up and talks to me. Unless it's my wife, then we sit there and talk all night, right? So there are some weaknesses in our life that it's okay for them to remain a weakness. That is not something that affects a lot of uh, my life. A weakness that could affect a lot of my life would be like um, uh, I've struggled with a, a lot of anxiety, uh, over the years. Uh, I, I, I worry a lot about things that really don't matter. Um, and some that do. Um, or let's say you have an anger problem. You're blowing up all the time. This is an example of a weakness that we need to get better at. Why? Because you can't just be this person going blowing. I guess you could, but you're not gonna give me any friends, right? Okay. So in our drumming, it's the same way. There are some weaknesses that we can look at and go, you know what? I'm okay with that being a weakness. Let's use one that a lot of my students will talk to me about. I am a I was a jazz studies major. That's what my degree in is in. I love it. You know, I love all types of music. So I do have a special place in my heart for that. But a lot of students say, I don't want to play jazz. And I'm like, cool. Then don't. I don't care. Like, you know, we may get to a point in your development where we should dive into some of the topics in jazz because I think that the nuances in them will help your other areas of playing. But you don't have to be a jazz player if you don't want to be. So this would be an example of if I've got a, uh, let's say I've got a 19-year-old student that comes in and they're really into uh, punk and hardcore. Let's just say that. Um, cool. Let's let's steer the lessons in the direction of that. And if we need to touch on some of those nuanced things that might come up in jazz, we can do that. But by the time we would get to working on jazz, usually the student has come to me and said, hey, man. I'm kind of hearing some things and I want that to show up my plan. It's like, okay, well, actually that player was a jazz player. They play in the metal genre, but let's, let's, so we backtrack and the music leads us to that, right? This would be an example of a weakness that's okay. It's like, no, I, I know I'm not the jazz player. If I get a, if I get a call for the jazz gig, I'm not going to do the jazz gig because I'm not the jazz player. I'm the punk metal guy, right? Um, or, or girl. Um, now, and to just, to, to juxtapose this against a, a weakness that we would want to shore up, let's say, uh, you say, you know what, my double stroke rolls, my doubles are just really sloppy. Okay, well, we're going to play a lot of doubles in our drumming. That's kind of one of the one of the foundations of what we're doing. Uh, my hand technique stinks. I've, I'm really stiff. Okay, well, that's a big thing. It's not okay to ignore that weakness. We need to shore that up to a certain point. You don't have to be the world's expert on hand technique or the best double stroke roll player in the world, but we do need to have that to a comparable level. So that's the distinction between those two weaknesses. One, I choose, yeah, I'm not that cat. The other one, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's going to be used in my playing a lot. That's a weakness that I do need to shore up. And so what we do is we, we define what our lane is. And there's a lot of, uh, you get a lot of this, when, especially when it comes to session drummers um, and live players uh, that are on the bigger gigs. Uh, let me give some examples that I've seen. Um, uh, a lot of session 
players will want to hear the track before they'll tell you they will do it uh, or, or cut it. But the reason is they want to make sure that it's in their lane. In the same right, you know, Nashville is known for country, CCM, contemporary Christian music, some pop. Um, it's really not known for, we were just talking about metal. Let's say metal. It's really not known for metal. So let's say a session player here in town gets a metal band and says, hey, we need you to cut a song. Well, chances are a lot of the session players are going to be like, that's not my, you need to go to this. They usually have a person. You need to go to this person. That's their lane. Because I'm not going to do the job that you want me to do. It's going to make me look bad. It's going to make you look bad. Let's go to the cat that does that, right? Um, so I'm just kind of trying to stay with the same examples here. These are these are real things that I've, that I've come across with different players, uh, projects that I've produced myself, other things. Uh, you know, uh, um, when it comes to uh, um, live playing, it's the same thing. It's understand A big one would be, do you run Ableton or do you not run Ableton? Now, nowadays... You really need to kind of know your way around that uh, if you're getting into the bigger genres. But like the gig I'm on right now, so I'm out with a Southern Rock group. They pride themselves in we don't run tracks. We run a click, but we run it from an iPad with the Tempo by Frozen Ape app. Like it's it's a little cumbersome, but we purposely keep the technology out of the set because we want it to be a little bit more of a raw experience, a little bit more of a throwback live experience. So if I if a person, I got called years back for a gig that they were going to need to send me all the tracks I was going to need to put it into Ableton and I was going to need to run that for my own laptop. Well, here's the problem. They called me for the gig, didn't tell me about any of that. And then the week before the gig, after they booked flights and everything, they said, okay, hey, by the way. And then they give me all this information that I needed whenever I booked the gig. And that was, we have a whole Ableton session. You're going to need to import it to your laptop. You need to bring that laptop and you're going to need to run this whole And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Hold on. That's not what you told me. Uh, I'm not set up for that portable rig. If you have that portable rig, I'll run it. But I'm not, you know. And so I I spent a couple days kvetching going, "Ah, you know, I could upgrade, you know, this. I could do the, you know. It was going to cost me quite a bit of money to go ahead and get outfitted for it. I had no doubt I could do it. But I was like, do I really want to pay this much money? And then I didn't have a lot of other gigs at the time coming that needed me to bring my whole Ableton rig, right? Um, so that's an example of a gig I wound up turning down and just telling them, hey, I'm not going to do this. I'm sorry you booked flights, but you didn't give me the correct information. I'm, I'm, if I would have known that, I could have told you at that time, yes or no, I would have had more time to prep. So that's an example of an area where I've backed off and said, hey, I'm sorry. Now, can I run it? Sure, I can run Ableton. I know the basics of it. If you want somebody that's in-depth, you need. To, I got some buddies that can in-depth program your Ableton shows. I'm not that cat. I'll run it for you, though. Um, I'm very good at learning spe- you know, project-specific things. So it's okay to understand that we're not great at everything. You don't have to be great at everything. And in your practice time, you need to take the time to look at what do I want to become good at? What do I not want to become good at? What are crucial things in my playing I'm ignoring, like doubles and singles and, uh, you know, technique or things like that, that is an actual weakness that I need to work on. And again, I related back to life, you know. I, I, I appreciate that my wife, you know, is not good at talking to other men. Like, that's a weakness I hope she keeps around, you know. And then there are other weaknesses that we need to, like, you know, communication maybe. I'm not saying that's a weakness of hers. I'm just saying, you know, maybe that would be an example of one that we needed to shore up, right, you know. Um my wife's perfect. She has no weaknesses, and that's the crazy thing about her. Anyway, the second thing <laughs> is, um, and I man, it took me a while. I mean, that my audio may have just gotten weird because I decided to go way back. Um, it took me a long time to understand this, um, because I thought I thought that um, professionals, you know, all my heroes just didn't make mistakes. I just thought that they never messed up. Um, and so I carried around all this guilt because I did mess up, you know, like I was messing things up, you know, and, um, and come to find out mistakes are not the problem. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone is going to mess something up. Um, recovery is the key here. The other thing is how they would view mistakes, right? Is this a mistake or was that a part of the song that was just different than before no one's going to look at it and be like what was that you know there's very few mistakes okay i'll give you an example of a mistake we were on stage a few weeks ago i counted off the wrong song 
They knew it because I did the drum fill for another song. But the singer took more time in between the song than he usually does. He was looking back at me. I'm sitting there. I looked at the set list real quick, and I skipped a song, and I counted that one off. This is an example of a mistake. And when you, if you're, if you're privileged enough to be in a spot where you see a mistake like this, it's, it's a great opportunity because usually they, they sit there and they go, Ugh, you know, brain fart. That was me. I went and saw the police uh, on their reunion tour years ago. Second row it was awesome. And Andy Summers, they were playing every breath you take. Andy, the rest of the band had gone to the bridge. Andy had not gone to the bridge. And I was sitting there going, uh, what's happening right here? Andy, you know, he's like jamming, thinking he's, and you, you know, you see Sting turn around at bridge. You know, you saw him mouth, you know, bridge. Well, Andy didn't see him. Then you see him kind of do the international, these are the chords we're on. You know, he turns his guitar to his bass to him. Andy doesn't see it. Then he turns it to him for a longer time where he's just kind of, you know, it's very obvious. Then he turns it towards him and yells at him, bridge you know and Andy starts laughing and he goes oh I effed up you know and you saw him say that he recognized it and it was kind of a hilarious moment for anybody close enough to see that um that's an example of like we messed up right they're, they're all you're always gonna at some point mess up but there's gonna be these minor issues every time you play so part of um those that play at, at, at an elite level how we view uh, mistakes. We might not always view them as mistakes. We didn't maybe pull off the thing we wanted to, but we pulled off something. And the, you know, did the people in the audience notice that it was off? Usually they don't, and so it's like, okay, that's that's an okay thing. So you're always going to make mistakes, but it's the recovery, it's the resolution of that mistake that makes it right or wrong, or not even right or wrong. It just makes it fit or not fit. Right? I was in a lesson in college on I play the vibraphone as well Dr. Wooten was teaching me uh, and I was soloing over this piece and you know trying to work through all the different um, scales and chords and trying to you know play in key and um, I, I hit a wrong note and I got done I said yeah sorry about that I, I made a mistake in there hit a wrong note and he said he said there are no wrong notes and I'm like okay here comes a D plus I'm like yeah there there are that one was pretty wrong he said there are no wrong notes there are only wrong resolutions and then I sat there for a second. I'm like, okay, what? And he said, watch. I'm going to do the same solo you just did in the same section. I'm going to play a lot of wrong notes, but I'm going to resolve them differently so that they are correct. In other words, they're just a passing tone. They were a little bit of a rub for a second, and then he resolved them. Uh, and he proceeded to play a lot of what I would usually think of as clams, but because of how he was resolving them, he was resolving back into what it needed to be. He didn't continue the mistake, and so it was kind of like, oh, it's kind of hip, you know? That was kind of a little bit of a, an edgy thing, right? Um, so they view them differently. I heard Herbie Hancock talk about this when he had played with Miles. He played a chord that was just, he says, wasn't anywhere close to being right. And he said, and I'm just sitting there hanging on it going, you know, where do I go from here? And he said, I saw Miles Davis cock his head. He said, and then he played a note that made my chord right. He said, because he didn't hear it as a mistake. He heard, he thought I was hearing something he wasn't hearing. He wanted to make sure he was, you know, uh, on the same wavelength with me. So really what it is when you make a mistake or you kind of screw something up, you, it's really the resolution. I guess this is a bigger life lesson. It's the resolution of the mistake, right? It's We're going to make mistakes. I was talking to my son about this the other day. I'm like, did you really think you were the only kid that was ever going to go through all their teenage years and not screw up? Like, did you think you were going to be that perfect person? Because you're not. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. You're going to make mistakes. I expect them, but how do we resolve them? How do we resolve the mistake? Because that's where uh, the beauty is. Sometimes what was a mistake can be the the, the biggest gift of your life, right? Uh, and um, or at least something that doesn't mean that doesn't stay a bad. We can turn it for better. The same thing with music. If we get out of our heads and we realize that we're in the middle of something that could go, you know, east or west, north or south, we don't know. Then you need to understand that showing it on your face is really a bad thing to do. Yelling at people across the stage. It's that these are the things that make it obvious to everyone that there is a mistake, right? This is why you see a lot of bands that have talkback mics because they can pass information around the band without having to yell, right? 
So it's all in the resolution. Your favorite players make mistakes all the time. It's in how you resolve those mistakes. Don't show it on your face. Get it, stay in the moment and figure out something creatively that makes that mistake at least be a passable moment, right? Um, and then the, the third thing is uh, you'll hear a lot of professionals talk about they, they never, they, you know, I don't practice. Um, I don't like saying that because as musicians, we need to do the things that musicians do, and that is play our instrument, right? Drumming is the way that I get to interact with other musicians. And so practice is playing that instrument. But what I didn't understand was your practice, your practice time and the focus of your practice time will morph as you move through your playing. Um, let me give you an example of this. You don't have to be playing professional. Let's say uh, I mentioned playing at, uh, at church early. Let's say you, you drum at your church or your house of worship. Um, and uh, every week you're having to learn four or five songs, which is pretty common if you're, if you're the, the main drummer there. Uh, and your practice time, you're spending most of your practice time learning that music. Well, the reason we're playing the drums is to play with other musicians, right? So learning music is practice. What we can do is we can understand and stay plugged in, like, what am I having trouble with here? What are the things I consistently struggle with? And then we can piece that off into exercises in our practice time. But make no qualms about it. My first teacher told me, he said, he said this, you know, if you get the music beforehand, if you get a recording beforehand, that's a gift because the music is supreme. It's above everything else. You have to practice that first and foremost. Lesson material comes after that. So many times when professionals say, I don't practice, yes, they do. They do, but it's different. They may be practicing for a specific gig. They may be learning songs. Uh, they may be um, running a track a few times before they record it. They, like But it looks more like this is just my job. And the job now is so enrolled in practicing that now we don't you know, I'm I'm in the middle of writing another uh, another book. I'm in the middle of writing a couple books. My my practice time, air quotes every day, is me running through the material for that book and figuring it out. I have to practice it because I have some concepts and I need to work them out uh, and make sure they work how I want them to and how I'm going to present them. Uh, but that wouldn't be like a typical you went to your teacher and they gave you something. This is more creative practice. So uh, understand that your practice time will morph. That maybe sometimes you'll be practicing more music, other times you'll be practicing more material, or maybe writing, other times you'll be practicing more legitimate material. Uh, I took a lesson years ago from Dave King, and, and he said, hey, I don't want you touching books anymore. Here's And he gave me a couple exercises that took me a very, very long time to get under my hands, and they weren't books. It was more about creativity and connecting things that I already knew. Um, so anyway, those are, I know that the title, some of you are like, oh, what is it? But seriously, these are things that coming up, they weren't talked about with me. I don't hear them talked about very often nowadays. Uh, and so, and, and I know firsthand that in, you know, when I, I wrote to Modern Drummer, there were, there were very specific things they weren't putting in there because they didn't thought, think it was a good spin on whatever we did. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's up to, to the publishers of, of whatever uh, publication that is. And I'm not lambasting them. They, um, I owe them an incredible debt of gratitude for keeping me connected to the drumming community early on. Um, but, you know, I, I do believe there are things that are, are in the trade of drumming that are not as talked about as often, and we figure those out a little bit later. So anyway, hopefully this has been helpful. Um, I would love for you to check out. We've got drum camps registrations have just opened. Uh, those will set. We've already sold over half of those. It's only been open for a couple weeks. Um, so be sure to um, check out that link. And if there's some spots, I'd love to meet you, hang out with you, spend a week with you and work on drums as well. Check out 14 day free trial to the online drum school, the drum better daily program at stevensdrumshed.com. I would love to have you in there. Love to have you be a part of one of the live calls that we do weekly and hang out with you. Uh, but whatever you do, go practice some and I'll see you in the next episode.